I can't believe BJ's Wholesale Club has all this great new stuff. Honey, this sofa is so stylish. Yeah, stylish. And this sweater is so on trend. Try it on. That's me, Mr. Trendy. And BJ's has the hottest brands at great prices, like Sir La Table and Nespresso. And Hot Wheels. <clears throat> Look, it's Barbie. Hi, Ken. Let's go to the beach in my Corvette. Attention, BJ's members. The club is now closed. Just five more minutes? Please. Saving club or on BJ's.com. Not a member? Join today. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings. Hey everyone, Ray here. Yes, I've got your next book for you. Pablo Picasso, Django Reinhardt, Simon de Beauvoir, and Jean-Paul Sartre. These were the modernist thinkers, writers, and artists who found refuge at Paris's famed Café de Flore in the 1940s, where creation was an action of sheer defiance under the noses of the Germans. It was here the Jewish Boo Arts student Annette Zellemann and dashing young poet and Catholic Jean Jussion, young, creative, part of a historic and legendary in-crowd, would fall passionately in love despite the darkening shadows of war. A new book, Star-Crossed, a true Romeo and Juliet story in Hitler's Paris, by Penn Award finalist Heather Dune McAdam and Simon Worrell, is a valentine to the city of light and the resilience of its people and a gorgeous tribute to France's modern art scene that flourished despite the occupation. This true love story follows their romance and the prejudices that would set the young lovers on a divergent and tragically inevitable paths. Based on never-before-published letters, archival sources, interviews, works of art, and family documents, the authors paint a novelist, painterly, and poignant story of love, art, and tragedy. Star-Crossed, available from Kensington Books, is available everywhere books are sold. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 436, Retreat, yes, but how? Now that all the beaches had been covered from Jubilee and most had gone poorly, it was decided to recall the men, and this was after General Roberts had sent in his reserves, who were equally disseminated. The situation was beyond repair by 9 a.m., but as Roberts wanted to keep trying, now was the time for Operation Vanquish. The re-embarkation of the men was to commence at 11 a.m. But there was a catch. There's always a catch. The original plan had called for all the units of Jubilee to leave via the Dieppe beaches, because the flanking movements were to have neutralized the guns closest to them, but then turn in and head towards the town. This would have guaranteed that the city and its German defenders would have been overwhelmed, and then the men could leave. But that's not how this was going to play out now. As hinted at last time, the plan to evacuate was just as cumbersome, unnecessarily so, as the attack. The South Saskatchewans were to have pulled back in ten different phases, but now they and the Cameron Highlanders of No. 4 Commando were all to leave in front of Portville, and that's where their LCAs were told to go. But no such arrangements had been made for Blue Beach. There was no one left there to rescue. As word went from one radio to the next, and then from person to person, many were excited for the moment, because that's when they figured out they would have to leave whatever cover they had, and for many, it was just a piece of the beach wall, and all their firepower had not weakened the Germans. And the truth was, the successful defenders, they were even stronger now, as General Haas had ordered more men and batteries to the coast. But some of the commanders on the ground did not want to wait for the order to retreat that was now passing through the radios. Major Andrew Law, leading the Camerons, his superior was now dead, had just given the order to retreat when it officially came through the radio. Ironically, this battalion had moved further inland than any other unit, though they never got to the St. Albee sur Sea airstrip. To be sure, their advance up the west side of the sea was difficult, but they had made it, even reaching the area near Petit Apfil, which is level with Dieppe's perimeter furthest from the beach. Still, it was not enough. Law's plan had been to cross the river here, head roughly due north, and attack the Quantra Vents farm 
from the rear. But waiting for the right moment, Law watched as horses pulled up large guns closer to the coast. This was a part of Haas's reinforcements. But still, there was no way Law could fight through that and then do more fighting at the radar station. Just as soon as Law finished telling his men, Not today, boys. We're heading home. That's when the radio crackled to life to tell them to head back to Portville, where they were heading anyways. This message had also gone through the Saskatchewans, who were still on the east side of the Sea River. And as hard as it was for them to get to this point, it would be a lot easier and a lot faster to get back to Portville, which they did by 10 a.m. Motivation is never to be underestimated. But the rear guards of each group of men heading back to the beach saw Germans quickly take their place as they had left. Clearly, someone or someones were going to have to stay behind, or at least not on the beach, to keep the Germans back. And one of the men taking up a station so others could get back to the beach was U.S. Ranger Sergeant Marcel Swank. He was on the eastern side of Portville at the moment and was a part of the perimeter. Suddenly, a Canadian carrying a Bren gun sat down beside him. Before Swank could say anything, he was scared to death, his throat was so dry, the Canadian half-raised and sprayed bullets in a few different directions. Swank looked to where the man shot, but did not see any enemy troops. But the Bren gunner simply sat down and waited. Seconds later, several guns from different directions started firing on the gunner and thus on Swank. Then the gunner braced himself, stood, and ran to somewhere. Swank wasn't sure where. This Canadian, who had been fighting for hours, had gotten into a rhythm. He would fire and fire until someone shot back at him. It would probably be a German, so the man would then run in that direction. Locate and destroy, I believe it's called. But Swank was not impressed with this man's tactics, at least not enough to copy them. In truth, the young man was simply terrified. As he would later write, I was 19 years old, and I just didn't want to die. Which is what Swank told a Canadian major a few minutes later, when he dropped down beside Swank. Was there a revolving door around him, Swank must have thought? The major, sizing up the young man pretty quickly, said, Don't worry about it. I've been in stickier places than this, and got out. And then the major said the one thing to Swank that actually made sense. He told him, get down to the beach. The first group of LCAs arrived at 11.04 a.m. It could have been 10.34 a.m. if Hughes Hallett had had his way, but General Roberts had demanded the 30-minute delay. The gunboats that escorted them and the destroyers behind them sent shells onto the cliff top and into the cliff face, but like before, the Germans were too well dug in. Few casualties came from this salvo. Still, the ships would keep firing, but the Germans continued not dying and set off their own weapons. And just to make this escape even harder, because why not, the tide had gone out, so now the men had to run an extra 200 yards through the enemy's mortar shells, bullets, and barbed wire. And the first to head down were the 23 or so prisoners who were to carry the stretchers of the wounded. But their comrades on the clifftop were not selective in their aiming. By the time all was said and done, only one of the German POWs was still alive to make it aboard a ship safely. Around this time, Swank, the ranger, ran into fellow ranger Sergeant Lloyd Church. They had been separated early on, and Swank was pleasantly surprised. Together, they gave themselves the job of carrying the wounded to a destroyed pillbox. This was the last stop before the wounded and whoever was carrying them made the dash for the beach. With no other wounded to care for, the two rangers made their own dash. But just as they left the seawall, Swank's legs were pumping as fast as they could, he suddenly realized he was running alone. Swank turned and saw Church on the ground. Blood was in his hair. But for Swank, a ranger, to think is to act. Still in his turning move, he started running for church, grabbed him, and dragged him back to the sea wall. It was a hell of a lot closer than those boats. Through the blood, church could see Swank thinking, but the prone man said something along the lines of, 
I can't make it. You know I can't make it, but you can. So go. Swank ran. As he came ever closer to the beach, a boat was stuck, and men were pushing it, while other boats had ropes and were trying to pull it off of the sand. Of course, the Germans took advantage of this, and men around the boat started to fall. Thinking it was only a matter of time before the boat was freed, Swank got alongside, just behind someone else, and was ready to climb over. The man raised his head up above the boat, and suddenly there was a smacking sound, a sick, meaty smacking sound, and the man fell back on Swank, knocking him into the water. The next scene could easily be in a horror film. Swank raised his head out of the water, where he saw lifeless bodies bumping into him. As for the man who had landed on him, he was now missing most of his face. But the ranger's hell wasn't over. Clearly, that stuck boat would not be leaving fast enough for Swank, so he spied out another boat pulling away and began giving his all to reach it. But he found himself traveling much slower than he knew he could go. When he looked down at his rifle, the front sight was caught on the clothing of another body. Swank had been pulling himself and this corpse to the boat. The ranger broke down his gun They could do this in seconds, even blindfolded, and soon the body was set free, as was Swank, which is when he noticed bullets smacking the water around him. Seems the snipers had finally found him. Proving that everyone was not giving into panic, someone called for the boat to stop. It did, and a rope was thrown to Swank. He grabbed it and climbed aboard, which is when a sniper's bullet finally found him. He was hit in the arm. It was only a flesh wound. But still, it had been quite a day for this 19-year-old. In all, about a dozen LCAs came to Green Beach in front of Portville, to the west of Dieppe. Some of the boats, because they were ordered to, had tried to make it to Red Beach in front of the town proper on its eastern side. But because so much smoke had been laid down and was drifting all over the place, these boats ended up at Green Beach. Only eight ships of those twelve would make their escape, now full of thankful men. Which meant most of the Saskatchewans and Camerons were safe, and some of that was thanks to the commander of the South Saskatchewan Regiment, Colonel Charles Cecil Merritt. Thus far, Merritt had dodged all German bullets, and now that his men were leaving, he would make sure as many of them as possible got away. So as the men were loading up, Merritt, leading a covering party, saw a man go down, but he was not dead. So the colonel ran up to him, picked him up, and ran to the relative safety of the seawall. And this he had done just after being shot by a sniper. As the LCAs drove away, there were still about 250 men near Portville. They guessed the boats would not be coming back, as it had been hell just to pick up the men they did. And the Germans were thinking the same thing, as their firing slowed considerably. In fact, many of them now were coming out of their hiding places to advance on the beach. The officers still on the beach huddled up quickly to discuss their options, and really, they only had two. They could keep fighting, though few Germans were dying, until they ran out of bullets, as in, go out in a blaze of glory, or they could surrender and hopefully survive this nightmare of a war as a POW. It beat dying on the beach for no discernible reason. The officers told the men to put down their guns. Before all the guns could be released, however, the Germans started showing up on the beach. But before the Germans got there, six Spitfires flew over Green Beach at Portville, and seeing the men below them, which they assumed were Germans, as clearly all their men had gotten away, So they strafed the area, which only added to the horrid tally of the day. But there was also courage on Red and White Beach, those just in front of Dieppe. Now that word had been given out about pulling out, the men closest to Dieppe had to focus on staying alive long enough to be on one of those boats when they came. At the moment, the Allied troops were either in the casino, along the seawall, or on the beach, and laying flat, trying very hard not to be noticed. The expectation of these men 
to make it back home, it had to be low, which may in part explain the courageous or devil-may-care actions of Captain Reverend John Foote of the Rileys. When this chaplain came ashore, he was one of four, he stayed close to the RAP, the Regimental Aid Post. It was set up in a small dip in the beach, providing at least the idea of cover. But again, the tide went out, and suddenly the RAP was only more exposed. So, it was decided to relocate it within a left-behind LCT. But just as the wounded men were moved there, and Foote had played a large role in that, risking his life, the LCT was hit again and again by shellfire. Suddenly, the ammo left on the ship started going off as well. Between the enemy and now friendly shells, the ship was no longer safe, from the outside or the inside. Still, nothing for it. The wounded were moved to behind the vessel. And by the time the wounded were moved, a few more of them had been lost. Though whether from enemy or friendly fire, it cannot be determined. When the Riley's commanding officer, Colonel Robert Bob Labatt, got the message of evacuation, he, like everyone else, thought, okay, but how do we stay alive until 11 a.m.? And for him, the answer was simple. If not palatable. In order to keep the Germans away from the casino, he would have to keep attacking them. To go into a defensive mode only gives the opponent the freedom of movement. No, the enemy here had to be kept back on their heels. But taking it one step further, Labatt also knew that he would have to have some of his men shoot into the west cliff and nearby buildings to keep the Germans' heads down. At least here, he was hoping for some help as he used his one barely operational radio to call in airstrikes and smoke canisters. He would have to wait to find out if anyone heard him. Meanwhile, the tanks below had returned to the beaches. As they could not go all the way into town, the crews decided they could see more and thus have more to shoot at by being on the beach versus trying to shoot almost straight up the cliff. And what these tank crews found out was that the Churchill's two-pounders might not be getting the job done, but the armor around them was keeping them safe. Not the worst trade-off. Above the tanks, and wishing they could do so much more, were about 130 soldiers within and around the casino. This was Labatt's dual headquarters, one for the Rileys and one for 4th Brigade. With the amount of wounded, not to mention the POWs, it would be impossible to get all of them down to the beach before they ended up dead or wounded. Just then, a company sergeant handed Labatt a pair of field glasses and pointed. The colonel looked to where the man was pointing, to the west headland, and there he saw a large group of German officers. They were smiling, laughing, some were smoking cigars, and a few were in their summer white dress uniform. This, this was beyond the pale for Labatt. He quickly ordered two Bren guns to open up on them. He watched gleefully as the officers took off running, and it did his heart good. But now it was time to get back to their escape. Just before the 11 o'clock hour, Labatt sent runners around the casino, telling the men to start heading towards the beach. Just then, two RAF planes flew long ways, that is, across the beach, laying down smoke. The German guns focused on the planes, the Allied troops focused on the smoke, and willingly ran into it. As for the men on the beach, they worried over the large German guns behind them, but they seemed to think little of the threat from above. Truth was, though the Germans' air arm had started out responding slow, by evacuation time, that is 11 a.m., all units within the area were activated. But whether it was the fear of the German mortars or that it happened way over their heads, literally, few survivors wrote of hearing or seeing planes from either side during their escape. But it has to be said, overall, the RAF kept the evacuees safe from the enemy planes. But a large part of that was that the German planes were going after the ships just offshore. After all, why shoot one man when you can sink a ship that could carry at least 25 men? No, 
it would be the fleet that felt the enemy's air threat more than most. During one early air attack, HMS Garth was straddled by a bomb. Captain Derek Turner, the bombardment officer of the Royal Artillery for Blue Beach, was standing on the bridge with Garanwi Rees and a few others. After the bomb went off, the men looked at each other. Suddenly, Captain Turner slumped to the floor. Keeping in mind the younger listeners, suffice it to say that Turner, his left index finger, was barely hanging on by skin, and a piece of his left hamstring was now sliding down the opposite wall. Turner would later write about this and say, I looked around to see if anyone else was hit. They hadn't, and that meat was a bit of me. Meanwhile, there was hell in the heavens. The opposing side's air forces came together. Early on, none of the larger ships watching over the LCAs were lost to German bombing. But as each minute went by, the attacks became larger. It didn't help that the RAF had to, one, try to attack the Germans on the beach and around the cliffs to give their comrades a chance. They were also laying smoke for the same reason, while fighting off enemy bombers and fighters. And it was during this air battle that impressive amounts of metal fell out of the sky. The British had, though it was a mixture of nationalities, several squadrons over any one beach at any one time. And during a single pass, a free French pilot was shot down over Dieppe. He was taken prisoner. An Australian was shot down, but fortunately came down on the harbor. Still, the Germans took him prisoner too, which left a British pilot to pay the ultimate price. Unfortunately, at least one pilot would be taken out by friendly fire. Jubilee would demonstrate that aircraft recognition had a long way to go. But the Allied pilots that survived that day, who would end up going home or end up in a POW camp, had nightmares that night. And the nightmare centered around the Falk Wolf 190. The pilots coming from Britain had tangled with the 190s enough to respect them. And it seems having lots of other Allied pilots around you didn't make all that much of a difference. Wing Commander Miles Duke Woolley, in charge of 232 Squadron, hesitated a second and watched as men died due to his inaction. In part, he would write, One German fighter dived out of the sun from a great height, attacked us head on, and I did not see him until he was maybe 600 yards away and firing. Our closing speed was probably around 800 miles an hour, say 400 yards a second and I failed to react in the second or second and a half at my disposal. He continues, The FW-190 shot down two Spitfires, killing both pilots, but the squadron most commendably did not waver. Another pilot wing commander, James Johnny Johnson, who had barely survived an earlier attack by a Falk Wolf, would write, The day proved to him the all-around superiority of the Falk Wolfs over the Spitfire Fives. What would have helped not only the pilots, but the ships in the channel and the men on the beach was if, I don't know, if they could work together. But as it's already been stated numerous times, the pilots could not raise the HMS Kalp on their radio. They couldn't raise anyone who could reach the Kalp on their radio. So, so far, Operation Jubilee had shown that the Allies won, the plane recognition needed work, their communication was practically non-existent, and lastly, their attacks on AA batteries left much to be desired. George Brown, who had landed at Blue Beach and then went to the clifftop with Colonel Cato's group, watched for hours as an AA battery on the East Headland was bombed at least four times and machine-gunned many more times than that, but was still able to regroup and rejoin the fighting. Seconds after the enemy plane attacked it. Per his report, the men would simply duck down and the bombs or bullets would go by and then they would pop back up and fire at the very plane that had just dropped a bomb or shot at them. Something more substantial was needed for AA attacks. When it came to the German pilots, they focused on the enemy fighters and the LCAs coming in to rescue the troops. These boat crews had bravely come in the first time 
to drop off the soldiers. Now they had to come back again and pick up the survivors. The chance of the boat crews making it out alive a second time were not high. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So just a couple of people to thank. Uh, let's see here. Michael Zett Hashauer from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Christopher Ashbury from Rochester, New York. And as far as donations, let's see here. Michael Pesok. So thank you very much to Michael, Michael, and Christopher. A lot of Michaels this time. And it was um, Thea who told me that episode 61 was missing. So for those of you who weren't aware, you, you probably passed it. Who knows what happened? Uh, there's 400 and something episodes out there, but it, it faded away. It dropped. So fortunately, I found my notes from years ago, re-recorded it, and Paul just added it back in. So Thea, thank you very much. And if anybody else sees anything missing, just shoot me an email to wwii. Uh, podcast at gmail.com and I'll hopefully I've still got my notes I'm trying to organize everything for the uh, for the podcasting library no not really uh, just for my own sanity and I'll put it back out there uh, so thank you to Thea and everyone else take care at Raising Cane's we're hyper focused on being the best at what we do and getting it right every time cook to order chicken fingers cane sauce crinkle cut fries coleslaw Texas toast iced tea and lemonade it's our one love but is the hype real yeah it's real good raisin canes chicken fingers one love <laughs> next time order with our app or online